I'm going to first set the stage a little bit. And then what I want to do is present to you some evidence for this whole Darwinian model, the Darwinian explanation of where humans came from. That I intend to take 40 minutes to do that. But then, if I've convinced any of you of that, uh, uh, what I want to do then is to say, what do we have to do with our Christian theology? How do we have to modify that? Because we will have to modify it. There will be changes. And then the questions and the feedback. So what I'm going to do is present these lines of evidence for, to you, and then I want us to look at them from two different viewpoints. One will be the traditional view, the one that the church has had for a couple of millennia, which is, as you can see right here, a special creation. Let's turn to, uh, special creation, which I will use synonymously, I'll use the terms intelligent design or common design. Common design in contrast to common descent, which I'll present in a moment. And that's the idea that two primal people were created by God from the dust 6,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. That's the traditional understanding. And I know there are, there's a spectrum of beliefs uh, that, that move away from that all the way to the modern scientific view, which is very different, saying that we arose through Darwinian evolution. Uh, again, I'll use the term common descent there. And from that point of view, we never numbered two, just two. We, in fact, we never numbered less than a few thousand. Uh, we descended from an ancestor thousands of years ago, well, millions of years ago, an ancestor, an ancestor that we share in common with other hominids, uh, both ones that are living, so for example, the chimpanzee, gorilla, and orangutan, but also ones who are now extinct, and I'm referring to the, the Neanderthals, and Denisovans, and Australopithecus, a lot of other interesting names. That, according to the theories, that, that occurred roughly 200,000 years ago, 400,000 years ago, and it happened in East Africa. Now, those two viewpoints are very different. They're completely separated in terms of uh, time, in terms of space, theologically, intellectually. They're very different views. And I want to now look at a few lines of evidence and look at these aspects of our design from this view or from that view, the traditional view or the modern scientific view, to see which of those two better explains the data. I'm going to do that. I'm going to present those data in three categories. First of all, I'm going to give you some examples of design which are just questionable. They're just puzzling. They don't raise any big issues, moral or ethical problems. But when we look at them and try to say, God did it that way, it makes us scratch our heads. But if we look at it from an evolutionary point of view, it's easier to understand. Then in the second category, I want to just touch briefly on, on a set of data which will disturb some people. And these are aspects of our design which do raise serious moral and ethical issues. If you're going to insist that God created us exactly as we are, then that raises questions, and especially for people who are not Christians, and they will turn this phrase intelligent design into malevolent design because of this. And I want to present some genetic data as well, and then we'll get on to the theology from that. As we look at these two, as we look at these various lines of evidence, I want to again go look at it from these two viewpoints. And because I'm a scientist, I'm going to make a prediction. I want to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to look for the following predictions. From the special creation point of view, we're going to expect that the things that we're going to look at, the design, the, the aspects of our biology and our genetics, they should be functional, they should make sense, they should be useful, and they should be perfect, more or less. I'm not going to be hard on that, but generally speaking, if we were created by an omniscient, omnipotent uh, uh, God, then you'd expect things to be perfect. You wouldn't be hindered by physical barriers. By, uh, pro if there's a, a design problem that has to be solved, he wouldn't be hindered by the physics. And so I, I think uh, in, in contrast, from evolution, we wouldn't expect things to be perfect. We would expect to find old designs underneath new designs. Remnants and pieces of old designs underneath new designs. We would expect to find clumsy solutions to design problems, those physical barriers. If there's a, something that the organism has to get over, some kind of a stress or a, a function that it has to accomplish, a clumsy solution is good enough. It only has to be good enough for evolution. And by good enough, I mean good enough to get the genes from one generation to the next. That's all it needs. It doesn't have to be elegant. It doesn't have to happen perfect. That's what we're going to expect from those two uh, different viewpoints. So let's now look at those first sets of data. Again, these are just aspects of our design which don't raise moral theological issues. They're just puzzling. Um, we'll start with, for example, oh, and I'm going to leave this image with you, this analogy with you. That's about an old stone schoolhouse. We have friends of ours who have turned an old stone schoolhouse into a modern building. I've been in this home, it's a beautiful home. Uh, you can see an image, this is actually a house down the road, but they've done the same sort of thing. And I, if, I don't know how well the picture is projected to the back, but you can see the modern home built on top of the new home. You can even see the old stone school, uh, the, sorry, the old bell that called the children to school. 
If I were to burrow, burrow into the walls of the of this building, I'd expect to find, for example, a cable that runs from the from the ground floor up to the ceiling, up to the roof where the bell used to be, uh, and that's what they used to use 100 years ago to call the children to school. Um, when my friends or my neighbors decided to turn it, turn it into a building, they just put a new wall on top of it. They didn't take the time to take the cable out. It took a lot of work. They just covered it over, but the cable is still there, and it's a testament to the history of that house. I would also expect, by burrowing into the walls, that I would find the aluminum wiring and the lead piping from a time when that was allowed, whereas now we have to use copper wiring and copper pipes. But again, I would find those things in the walls, and it's a testament to the history of that house. So let's now look at some of these things. We'll begin, first of all, with the fact that some people can twitch their ears. My, my son is one who can do this. They can either twitch their ears or they can move their whole scalp. And the reason they can do that is they have muscles attached to their ears. And in fact, each of you have muscles attached to your, your ears, except some people have learned how to activate those muscles just by trial and error. They just learned how to activate those muscles and twitch their ears. The question is, why would God have given us muscles attached to our ears? I don't know. It's puzzling. It doesn't raise a problem for me, but it's just puzzling. But if I look at it now from the point of view of evolution, you've seen this in your dog and your cat. They have ears that they swivel around to catch sound. Uh, I think it's humorous when I see my dog at home, he'll be facing this way, but his ears are turned completely backwards <laughs> to catch sound. It serves a function in those animals. It's a very useful function, and I can understand that we might have descended from an ancestor that had those ears that they could swivel around, and then for some reason over the course of time, we just lost that ability. We lost a knee. But those muscles are still there, just like the cable in the wall of that old stone schoolhouse. They're still there, but we just don't need them anymore. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some nerves that come down from the head. You can see on the right-hand side, there's some nerves on the, uh, from the human coming down from the head. And one in particular, I don't know if you can read it in the back, the recurrent laryngeal nerve comes down from the head. And its target is the voice box. So its target is right here. But as it goes towards the voice box, it passes. It goes all the way down into the chest, underneath the heart, loops under the aorta, and then comes back to its original target. And that's a ten, roughly 10-inch ten diversion in the human, but in the giraffes, we can find the same nerve, and it goes 10 feet out of its way into the chest cavity and back up to its target. And the question is, why would God have given us that nerve that does that? There isn't a good reason, and again, it's not a moral problem. The big issue is not. It's just puzzling. But we can explain from an evolutionary point of view. We can trace those same nerves. We can go through the various animals and go backwards through the tree of life, the evolutionary tree of life, and find that same nerve. And we can trace it even as far back as an ancestor that we shared in common with fish. Because we can see these nerves in fish. We can, we can see those same nerves traveling from the head to their various targets, and they more or less go straight to the target. But presumably over time, over millions of years, as that ancestor that we shared as it began to morph, as the body plan began to change, and the head moved one way, and arms and legs, the, the fins turned into arms and legs, and just the whole body of rearrangements were occurring, that nerve that went straight, now I had to take a little bit of a detour, and then over time, a greater detour, and a greater detour, until finally today, we see the nerve going all the way 10 inches into our chest, and back up, or in the case of the giraffe, 10 feet. Uh, let's look at another one. Uh, goosebumps. We all have goosebumps. You, you, you've noticed them when you get cold or when you get scared. And that, what goosebumps are, are basically the hair in your skin that has a little muscle attached to it, and with the right simulation, it pops up at attention, and, and, and that's what a goosebump is. Why would God have given us goosebumps? I don't know. They don't, do, they don't serve a good function for us. But in the case, again, of animals, we see those same hairs in those animals, and they have two very important functions in the context of fear or of cold. So, for example, here you see a picture of the family cat, presumably being threatened by the family dog. And the first thing the cat does is arch its back and fluff up its fur, probably trying to tell the dog that, okay, maybe I'm a little bit bigger than you had originally thought. And meanwhile, the dog facing off the cat has its hackles up. It's a threat. Uh, it's, 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 it's intending a threat, and the cat is responding to that threat with those hairs up on end. If the dog comes at you and you see its hackles up, I guarantee you, you're going to feel the, the, the hairs on your neck come up. It's a, a severe response. And in the animals, it does serve a purpose. It makes, it, like, in this case, the cat look bigger. Uh, it, it signals an intent from the dog. The dog is send, sending the message that it's, uh, it's uh, a threat. Um, the other context where these hairs serve a useful function is in the context of cold. Again, the cat, you'll see, 
lying on the on the couch, and it's all fluffed up, and it's it's got its hairs uh, it's all, its hairs are all fluffed up. It's trapped in a layer of air around it to keep it warm. Uh, you can see this the deer in the backyard who blow all through the winter, uh, reasonably comfortably, in part because they have those same hairs that they lift up and trap a layer of air around them. Now, I defy any of you, and I'm going to speak now specifically to the men in this room, I'll defy you to stand outside for a few days with only your shorts on. And I'll give you shoes as well, but no socks, no pants, and no shirt. And see how long you last, even though you have goosebumps. They, don't, they won't keep you warm very long. So in humans, those goosebumps don't make us look more threatening. They don't, uh, we, they don't signal threat. When an attacker is attacking you, you won't notice whether he's got his goosebumps up or not. And they certainly don't keep you warm. So the question is, why do we have goosebumps? Taking too long on this one. Um, fingernails. Why do we have fingernails? I don't know. They're good for scratching lottery tickets, but not much else. I can't explain them from the point of view of a special creation point of view, but certainly, again, from an evolutionary point of view, they're the remnants of claws. Those claws were, again, used in as a defense or as a threat, as a weapon. They're also used to dig holes in the ground and various things. So the claws were very useful, and presumably over the course of time, over millions of years, we just lost the need for them or, or the ability to use them but we still have the fingernails left. Uh, the last thing that I'll mention, I just didn't want to show a picture because it might bother some people, and that's the fact that some people are born with a tail. It's a very rare event, but some people are born with a tail, and that's because all of us at some point during, during the gestation in the mother's womb, we all had a tail, but we had other mechanisms that then broke the tail down and resorbed it. But a few people, for whatever reasons, those mechanisms have broken down, and they're born with a tail. And the question, again, is why did God give us a tail? I don't know, but from an evolutionary point of view, it makes sense. If we are descended from an ancestor, they had a tail. It served a good function. It was a counterbalance as they were jumping around through the trees or on the ground. And we just, over the course of time, lost the need or the use of that tail. So I'm going to move on from that category. Those are all ones that, again, don't raise serious moral, moral or ethical issues. But then there are some that do. And again, this is... This is a fodder for those who want to attack the Christian religion and say, if you want to talk about intelligent design, I'm going to call it malevolent design. Now, I could talk about several of these. I'm only going to pick one, partly because of the time. I don't have a lot of time to go through this. I'll also talk about the convergence of the esophagus and the trachea. These are the two pipes that come down from your neck, go into your body. One is attached to the stomach and the intestines, and that's how we get food into our bodies. The other one is the trachea, which attaches to the lungs, and that's how we get air and oxygen into our bodies. So two very different functions, two very different tubes, but they come together at the back of our throats. And so all of the food and the air and the water are all coming in and out through the same hole, our mouth. And that design raises huge problems for many people. Uh, some people, for example, have lost the ability to really effectively control the swallowing. They may have some kind of disease. I think Lou Gehrig's disease is one good example. But they just have lost the ability to, to swallow well, and so they're always struggling with the saliva that accumulates in their throat. And certainly they would struggle if they, if they have uh, food or vomit in their mouth. It's a serious issue for them. It's also an issue for people who have too much uh, acid in their stomach. It gets up into their esophagus, spills over in the trachea, and then they get acid in their lungs. And that's a serious problem for some other people. And it isn't just diseased or, or uh, I'll say diseased people, it's also normal, healthy people who struggle against this design. Uh, some of you may decide to go to the beach, take the family, enjoy God's creation, you go in the water, inhale some water, and you drown. Or you take the family again to celebrate God's creation, you take them to the, a restaurant, get a steak, take a bite that's too big, and you choke on it, and you die. So because of that design... We have serious problems, and the people who would challenge intelligent design and call it malevolent design would say, God should have known better. That's what they will say. And I want to emphasize, I'm not challenging God. I'm challenging our interpretation of, what, of how God may have done things. So if we insist that God made us exactly as we are, as Psalms puts it, we're fearfully wonderfully made, if we're going to insist explicitly on that, we do raise issues, and this is one of them. And I think we have to have a response for that. Um, I think we'll move on from there. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about the genetics. Um, I'll use the analogy of marking student essays in American history. That's something that I don't do. I have a colleague here, Adam, I don't know if he's here yet, but Dr. John Seaman would mark essays in American history. I don't. Oh, there he is. Hi, John. Um, but this, the analogy works better for what I want to say, and John wouldn't give this part of the talk, so I have to do, this, do so. Um, imagine that I give students uh, the assignment that they can... Uh, write an essay on any aspect of American history they can choose. Uh, now, 
any event in history has, there's an explicit event in that history, there's explicit names that are, are attached with that, places, events that lead up to it, and then as well, others that come out from that. There's all kinds of uh, uh, important details associated with a given uh, event in American history. As I go through these essays, let's say the first one chooses the topic, uh, the, the Great Depression. They, they talk about that. There's very, uh, very specific events that they talk about, the events that lead up to it, the names attached, etc. They write a great essay, they do a great job, and she gets a great mark. I pick up the second essay, and they've done the same thing. They've also written on the Great Depression, but it's got the same information. It's got the same facts, the same names and places, and events that lead up to it. Everything is the same, but they've rearranged in various ways and done a different job. And again, I've done a great job, and I also give them a great mark. I come to the third essay, and now they've picked a different topic. Let's say the, the First World War, and again with a, a very specific event, names, faces, events leading up to it, etc. But this student does so in a very bizarre way, a uh, very disappointing way. As I read it, I find all kinds of spelling mistakes. I find all kinds of grammatical errors. As I'm reading along, I find a paragraph that's half finished. Obviously, they didn't have enough time. They, they started the paragraph, moved on, and didn't come back, so there's a half-finished paragraph. I find that they go through the timeline in a random order, in a way that doesn't make sense to They're jumping back and forth and all over the place in the timeline. And they also make a curious reference to The Simpsons, the, the, family, the, sit, the sitcom. They make a reference and somehow tie in the Great Depression to a Simpsons episode. Now, I give them a poor mark, but I'm not surprised because some students can't write a good essay. But where I really get bothered is when I pick up the fourth essay, and here I'm getting to my point. That student also writes about the, uh, the Great Depression, the same facts and everything that's the same. But they also have the same spelling mistakes, the same grammatical errors, the same half-finished paragraph, the same reference to the Simpsons episode, the same chaotic timeline, jumping back and forth. But they also have other things. They have done some other things, which in one sense makes the, the, the essay unique and their own. But it's those commonalities between those two that I cannot not make the conclusion that there was some copying going on. That one copied from the other, or maybe they worked on it together and tried to pass it off as an independent work. It's those unique commonalities, the mistakes that are in the essays, that I say I cannot dodge that, that conclusion. And that's what we're going to see in the genetics. So let me first talk about some of the overall similarity in gene sequences and layout. And as I do so, let me first talk a little bit about DNA. Uh, I think everyone in the room here will know that the DNA is that molecule in our body that contains all the information that the body then uses to, to make cells and do other things. It's a very long molecule. It's actually, if you stretch it out, it's about 10 feet long in humans. And there's one of those in every cell in your body. The cells are smaller than you can see with a microscope, but there's this 10 foot long molecule that's in each of those cells. How does the cell do that? Well, what it first does is it takes this 10 foot long molecule and chops it up into chunks. And then it takes each of those chunks and begins to compact them down and coil them and just get them into a small shape. And then it puts all those molecules, those pieces of the DNA molecule into the cell. And that's what you're seeing here. These are those chunks of DNA. These are referred to as chromosomes. And you may have heard the word chromosome. <coughs> Some diseases are related to a certain chromosome. For example, Down syndrome is related to chromosome number two, a problem with chromosome number two. Uh, we, I'm speaking, uh, very generally speaking, uh, scientists have a way to, to stain the DNA. We can add a certain dye that colors the DNA in different ways, the chromosomes in different ways, and that is, allows us to pick out this chromosome versus that one. We can identify the chromosomes more easily. And here what we've done is we've lined them up in order, order of size. I don't know how well this is projecting to the back, but these are ordered in, a, in order of size, and then they're also numbered underneath. And you can see that uh, we go up to the number 22, which represents 22 pairs of chromosomes. We have two of each of these, plus the XY pair, the one that determines whether we're a male or female. So we humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. When we look at the mouse, which is on the other side of the slide, they have 20 pairs of chromosomes. We've done the exact same thing with those. We stain them in the same way, and we find that the mice have only 20, whereas we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And what's more, if you make a comparison between any one of these chromosomes in the mouse, and you try to find one in the human, you won't find one that corresponds. They don't really line up very well. They don't match up. But when we do this and compare human versus chimpanzee, gorilla, and orangutan DNA, we find amazing similarities. Now, this is a very complicated slide, and I, as I've said a few times now, I hope this is projecting well in the back. What I'm showing you here are groups of four. You can see there's one group of four, and here's another group of four, another group of four. All of these are groups of four. And within each group of four, there's the human DNA, the human chromosome on the left on the left hand side, and then chimpanzee, gorilla, and orangutan. 
And in contrast, what we saw in the most, where you really couldn't match up chromosomes together here, we could easily take one from the, from the monkey, from the chimpanzee, and find a very close match in the human chromosome. And yes, there are differences, but even some of those differences are really compelling. Here, I want to focus your attention on one of those groups of four. This is chromosome number five. And again, here's the human chromosome, and then the chimpanzee, the gorilla, and the orangutan. And you can see there's amazing similarities between those four chromosomes at the top and the bottom. And there are some differences in the middle, and even those differences are compelling. I want to focus your attention on, uh, on this monkey chromosome, for example. Let's break this up into fifths. So here's one fifth, two, three, four, five. And you can see that the third, fourth, and fifth parts of that monkey chromosome are identical to the human. So is the first. But when we, if I call your attention to the second of those fifths, and all it's done here is just using the computer, just draw a box, copy and paste it back in place. You can see that that's what I've done. Now I'm just going to put it back in upside down. And now when you look at this human, or sorry, this chimpanzee chromosome from top to bottom, it's basically identical to the human chromosome. That's dramatic. That's provocative. Now some of you will say, well, what do you mean? You don't just take little bits of DNA and put them in upside down. That You can't do that. But actually, you do do that all the time. Each one of you, when you were forming in your mother's womb, when the, when the, the mother's DNA and the father's DNA were coming together, the chromosomes line up, and there's all this mixing and matching, cutting out and moving and pasting and a flurry of that kind of activity, it happens all the time, and it happens under other circumstances later on in life. This is not a new thing, not a very uh, science-shattering uh, kind of thing to propose. And that's why any given mother or father can have 20 children, and all the children look different. They look different from each other, and they look different from the parents. They'll have different hair colors, generally speaking. They'll have different IQs, different susceptibilities to de uh, disease. They're very different people, even though they came from the same DNA. And that's because at that fertilization event, this DNA is moved and sent. Basically, imagine a pack of cards and you shuffle the card. That's what happens at fertilization. So that's one line of evidence that I want to call your attention to. These amazing similarities in the sequences and layout. But then there's also similarities in the, in the mistakes. And again, I want to remind you of that analogy, the student essay. It was that half-finished paragraph, that strange chronology that was all over the place, the same spelling mistakes in the same places. That was compelling to me. I could not say that there was no copying going on between the students. And we see the same thing here in the DNA. Uh, can I ask what time it is? 10 to 5. Okay, I have to move more quickly. Um, I'll, I'll be more selective. Let me talk about proviral insertions. That's a big name, but basically what it means is bits and pieces of a virus left over after an infection. So when a virus infects you, many viruses do this, they will insert their DNA into your DNA. And they do that so that they use your cells to make more viruses that you can then pass on to other people. We fight off those infections, we get rid of most of the viruses, but some bits and pieces of virus DNA stays in our DNA. And if that happens at a place in time, and by place I mean in the right cells, namely either a sperm cell or a cell that makes sperm cells or egg cells, if that infection happened in those cells before sexual reproduction happened, those bits of viral DNA would then be passed on to the children. Not the, not the virus, not the infection, but the bits and pieces of the viral DNA get passed on to the children. And you can find that then in their children, and their children all down the line, that little bits, those bits and pieces of DNA from the virus are passed on down the family line. When we look at human DNA and chimpanzee DNA, we find these viral insertions, these bits and pieces of viruses, and they're in the same places as in the monkey, as in chimpanzee compared to the human. Now, how do we explain that? There's a few explanations. Maybe you can come up with a fourth one. I'll give you three. The first one is that, as some people would say, humans were made completely separately from the monkeys, from the chimpanzees, and just by chance, by chance, those viruses inserted in the same place in the human and the chimpanzee chromosomes. Well, let's do a little bit of math. It'll be very generally just uh, back at the end of kind of uh, mathematics. That DNA molecule I told you was 10 feet long. There's 3 billion positions in that DNA. And the chance that the virus inserts here or there then is 1 in 3 billion. It can be anywhere in there, and the chances of it here or there are 1 in 3 billion. And the chance that then it happens in the same position in the, in the chimpanzee chromosome is 1 in 3 billion. There's a 1 in 3 billion chance that the, that the monkey will have the same random insertion as we do. But it's not just one virus. There's a second and a third and a fourth. There's a hundred. I don't know how many. There's, I think, thousands of proviral insertions in our DNA, and we can find matching ones in the chimpanzee DNA. 
And it's not just the same virus, there's different types of virus. So this insertion happens to be type A, that insertion happens to be type C, and this happens to be type J. There's all kinds of different viruses, and they're all in the same position as the humans and chimps. The chances are astounding. If, if you know how st statistics work, how pro probability works, the chances are 1 in 3 billion times 1 in 3 billion, not plus. Times 1 in 3 billion, times 3 billion, times 3 billion, times 3 billion, all the way down the end. It's a huge number. So that first explanation, that just by chance that monkeys had the same assertions, the chance of that happening is a huge improbability, and I, 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 I would find it hard to believe. The second explanation would be that God made it that way. God gave us those viral assertions, and he gave the monkeys the same assertions. I don't know why he would do that. The third explanation is, as I said, you can see this viral insertion from the parents to the children to the children to the children, well, if you go backwards in time, presumably that we had an ancestor, if we go far back enough, that ancestor had a virus, had an infection, fought it off, but they got that at a time when the remaining bits and pieces of viral DNA were passed on to the children, who one set of children became eventually humans, and the other sets of children eventually became the various primates. To me, that's a more reasonable explanation. Um, I have to go very quickly through these. We have the, we have the gene for making egg yolk protein. Why would we have egg yolk protein? Uh, and certainly other animals, reptiles, birds, and other animals will lay eggs, and they, they will need the egg yolk protein. Why would we need the gene for protein? I don't know. I made reference to the fact that we're born, some people are born with a tail. Actually, all of us have a tail, but we're not all born with that. And in some cases, that the, the genetic networks around that to remove it have broken down. And again, I ask the question, well, why do we have this genetic network to make a tail? I do want to get to this last one, the fusion of chromosome number two, and this is a big one. So I'm going to be ready. <coughs> I'm going to go back to that very complicated picture, and I want to remind you we're looking at groups of four. These are the various, various human chromosomes matched up with the chimpanzee, gorilla, and orangutan. And I do want to call your attention to chromosome number two. And I want to set the stage a little bit here. When we, scientists, I'm speaking generally, when we found out a way to stain these chromosomes, pick them out, and began to uh, study them, uh, what we found was that humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, but the chimpanzees have 24. And that finding immediately was leapt on by many creationists and said, aha, that's obvious evidence that we, we were created separately from the chimpanzees. There's no way that we could have come from a common ancestor that involved us throwing away a whole chromosome. Chromosome contains hundreds, if not thousands, of genes, and that's a tremendous amount of information. There's no way that we could descend from an ancestor by throwing away a whole chromosome, and nobody would argue against that. that everybody would agree that's not that wouldn't make sense. But as we look more closely at the story, the answer, the, the solution to this problem, came back to the evolutionary camp. We began to notice that as we used these stains and picked out the, the chimpanzee chromosomes and massed them up the human chromosomes. We found that one of the chimpanzee chromosomes that I'm highlighting here in yellow bears a, a striking resemblance to chromosome number two, the top half of chromosome number two in the humans. And another chromosome in the monkey, in the chimpanzee, bears a striking resemblance to the bottom half of chromosome number two. The story begins to look like maybe those two chromosomes in the primates fused, and that's what we now have. Our, our, our uh, descent from that common ancestor involved a fusion of two chromosomes into one, and that's what you're seeing here. I'll finish, I will explain a little bit more, but that, that to me is a better explanation than... Uh, well, well, let me... I'm going to finish this point first. <clears throat> in addition to finding these, these similarities, we find bits and pieces of broken parts of a gene in our chromosome number two. One of those bits and pieces are a thing called telomeres. Uh, I'm labeling it here, disrupted telomeric sequences. Telomeres are the ends of the chromosome. I'll, I'll point, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but at the ends of all these chromosomes are telomeres, or telomeric sequences, all along the top ends and all along the bottom ends. And the analogy we often use, we scientists will often use this, that's like the plastic at the end of a shoelace. The shoelace is a long, flexible molecule, and you will put plastic around the end of it to protect the ends. Well, that's what telomeres do in the chromosomes. They are protecting the ends. And when those ends, those telomeres break down, you begin to have other problems, especially related to aging. So we have these telomeres at the ends of our chromosomes. That's where they belong. But what we, what we find in, in uh, chromosome number two are some bits and pieces of broken telomeres right here in the middle. They don't belong there in the middle. Uh, and at, by chance, by chance, it happens to match up with where the telomeres of those uh, primate chromosomes are. It makes more sense to me that those two chromosomes fuse together producing one chromosome out of the two, and bits and pieces of chromosome are left behind. It's a sloppy mess, 
and I can see evolution coming up with that, but I can't understand why God, especially if we take the very extreme view, God making Adam from the dust, making various parts, including chromosome 2, and then he sprinkles some broken pieces of telomeres in the middle. I don't know why he would do that. One last thing about chromosome 2, we find other bits and pieces of broken chromosomes in there. These are central mirrors, uh, central bodies, or central, yeah, central bodies. We find central mirrors more or less in the center of all chromosomes. So I'll point here to the central mirrors. And these chromosomes, they're the pinched regions, and I'll point to that here as well. They're not always in the center. You can see this one displaced off quite a ways to the more to one side. And some can be really displaced to the very far end. You can see those in these primate chromosomes here. Those are the centromeres, those pinched parts. Those serve a function as well. Uh, when one cell wants to divide into two separate cells, the first thing it does is it duplicates all the chromosomes. And then the cell will grab those chromosomes at those centromeres, those pinched parts, and pull them apart. And that's the way it moves chromosomes around within the cell. They serve that function. They're very important. And the puzzling thing is, in our chromosome number two, there is a centromere. We can see it there. It has very distinct structures that we can label. But there's some bits and pieces of broken centromere here as well, which happens to match up again with that chimpanzee chromosome. Whatever, I forget the, the number of the chimpanzee chromosome. Very puzzling observations that I find more easy to explain from an evolutionary point of view than that traditional Christian uh, theological point of view, which says, according to Genesis, we were made that way. I, I don't know how else to better explain. So those are several lines of data that I want to look at. From those two different viewpoints, and from, from my point of view, the evidence more stacks in favor of that modern scientific view. I was a young Earth creationist. I was... I did at one point see Genesis as literal, but after spending some time looking at some of the science, I haven't looked at it all, and I've only presented to you a few bits and pieces of it, the evidence just makes it so compelling to me that the modern scientific view, view is a better explanation. I want to now move on into that lap, the, the more important part of this talk. What do we then do with our Christian theology? And the answer is not throw it out. I don't think that's the answer. But there are some questions that we have to address that now, because of this new uh, viewpoint, we do have to revisit. The first of which is, that I'll talk about, is the fall in the garden. The traditional idea of the fall in the garden was two people, they made a mistake, and because of that, we have original sin, and etc. Well, if there was no two, original two people, what do we do with that concept of original sin? What do we do with that? And out of that, out of that, out of that Augustinian concept, then we have to begin to ask questions, then if we check, if we... Uh, second guess original sin, what do, we, what do we do with that whole concept of salvation, and then what do we do with Christ's death on the cross? These are important questions that we have to need to that we have to revisit if we're going to do away with that whole fall in the garden story. Now some people again in this room are going to say, no, 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 no. We, we, we take the fall story as metaphorical. We don't take it literally, we take it metaphorically. But yet, and, and many people can do that, but a lot of people can't. But more importantly, those who do take that view still will use phrases like, we're all fallen creatures or we're broken image bearers. That's a common phrase that you hear all the time, even from people who are very comfortable with taking Genesis as a metaphor. The problem is I no longer can see us as fallen creatures. If we, we weren't in the garden, we weren't perfect, and we didn't fall. And I'm going to draw this trajectory out a few times now. We didn't fall, we, didn't, we weren't broken, uh, we were never perfect to begin with. According to the theory of evolution, we were, in fact, out here, as a hymn has it, we were a worm. And over time, we became, we approached perfection. I'm not going to say we're anywhere near perfection, but we were approaching perfection anatomically, behaviorally, intellectually, and perhaps even theologically. I'll, I'll come to that at the end of my talk, where maybe we've been on a theological evolution as well. So we've been on this trajectory. It's the data tell us we've been doing this and not falling down. Now, in both cases, I still think that God causes to perfection. That, you can retain that. But this whole idea of us being fallen creatures, I can't, I can't use those terms anymore. Uh, and we have to better explain other things. So, for example, the fallen nature versus base instincts. Many of the things that we would now call sin were part of that whole trajectory, which I wouldn't say God was involved in that. He was more or less supervising in, in some way. We, I don't know how to explain exactly how, but I can still say God was involved in that evolution. And that evolution involves some things that we would now call sins. Uh, so, for example, selfishness. We had to be selfish. We had to hoard resources to ourselves in order to get the genes on to the next generation. That was part of our evolutionary heritage, and you can still see it in the dog and the cat and the seagulls fighting over scraps of food. They're still very selfish. Uh, I just want to, I want to remind myself of, of a few others here. Um, 
uh, stealing from the, the seagulls, eating as much as you can. That was part of our heritage. We had to eat everything that we could, and now we have to suppress those urges. Uh, the need to kill is threatened. That was part of what we had to do when we were various organisms along the way. We had to kill to survive, but we don't need to now. We have to suppress those urges. Sexual promiscuity. There was a time when we had to be promiscuous to get the genes out there. We had to, to get the, the, the genes out there. But now we need to reconsider that. We have to, uh, consider yeah, I'm gonna leave it at that. Uh, one that's really important to me, though, one that's really important to me, though, is tribalism. We had to be tribal at one point. We had to view the other as a threat, and by the other, the other was anybody. If you had a different color skin, if you had a different uh, allegiance to a sports team, if you had a different favorite rock star, you are the other, and you become my my enemy. Because of that whole tribal instinct, that that xenophobia, that was part of our heritage. We had to have it to protect the tribe. But we don't need to do that anymore, and we have to fight against it. That's something that, that we really need to fight in today's society. Um, I, I'm going to move on from those. Um, so, just revisiting that whole idea of whether we're fallen or not, I, I think we need to revisit that. Death and disease is written into the story. Many people will, will attribute death and disease to that story in Genesis, but we know that death and disease have been around for millions of years, long before there was humans. We can see the evidence of death and disease. In, in fossils, it, there's many examples in archaeological records of death and disease long before there was even humans. Uh, the genealogies in the Bible, especially the one that's in the Gospel of Luke, where the, the writer of Luke ties Jesus directly to Adam. He goes through generation by generation and ties Jesus directly to Adam. Now, I don't question the historicity of Jesus. I fully believe, as much as you do, that he was a historical person. I believe many of the things that you do about Jesus. But I don't believe he was a, a, a descendant of Adam. Or at least not Adam as the first person of all humans. Another interpretation would be that Adam was actually the first of the Abrahamic line, the Semitic race. Uh, it's a bit fuzzy, more fuzzy than that, but that's an alternative explanation. But I don't believe that Jesus was a descendant of an Adam who was the first human. And that then calls into question some of the things that, that Paul will speak about. Paul refers to the first Adam and now the second Adam. We have to look at those verses again and reinterpret them if we're going to hold this other view. Um, the Imago Dei, the fact that, is that that would be Latin for in the image of God. We are made in the image of God, so the Bible tells us. Well, if we now revisit that whole Genesis story and, and see that it's not a, a literal story, what do we do with that concept of being created in the image of God? There are some questions that we can explore a little bit more than that. But then lastly, I, I passed over the one important question as well, Scripture. Uh, we have to revisit these issues of inerrancy, infallibility, authority, and uh, inspiration. Um, many people, again, in this room, I, I talk to them many times, they don't really have a big problem with challenging inerrancy and fallibility, but many other people do. And I would almost hesitate to say the vast majority of North Americans in particular hold this view that Scripture is inerrant and infallible, and I think we need to re revisit all those things. The last point I want to make, and I'm just, I think, five minutes before the end of my talk, is this concept that all humans have rebelled against God. That was a point that was made to me frequently as I, as, as I was growing up in my faith in response to my, my challenges, which were, why am I guilty just because my great-great-great-grandfather Adam had uh, committed a sin? Why do I inherit guilt? And one of, the, one of the explanations is, well, no, all humans have rebelled. All humans have sinned. We all deserve eternal punishment for conscious torment. And these are things that I, I'm really trying to resolve in my own mind right now. But I want to challenge that one phrase, the beginning of that whole assertion, have all humans rebelled against God? I want to present some data to you that I think challenges that. Let's look at the timeline of human history. I'm going to focus especially on the last 100,000 years, but recognizing that humans go back several hundred thousand years. The evidence is there. That's where we originated as a species. During that time, during that 100,000 years, I can imagine those primitive humans, primitive, primitive hominids, before they were able to speak and write, just looking up at the sky and sensing the great being. As Romans puts it, we, we can see uh, God in, in the handiwork in the skies. And you'll see in a moment why I'm going to make these points. I think at that point they were already beginning to sense a God. And as they thought about it in, in whatever way that a human who can't speak or talk would think about it, I don't know. But as they thought about it, they began to generate ideas. They began to paint things on cave walls, and we can see examples of those. They reached a point in, in their uh, development where they could begin to speak, and they began to share their ideas over the campfire, talk about this great being, and what they think the great being was. And eventually, we as humans came to that point where we could then begin to write things down. 
And that's where we would see the Bible being read. The Bible wasn't, we didn't get books of the Bible, depending on your viewpoint and, and when and where and how we got the books of the Bible, didn't appear till the very end of that timeline, in just the last few thousand years. And we've been around for well over a hundred thousand years. So during that whole time when we're rebelling, we were actually looking for God. And you'll see why I make that point in a second. But at first, I'll also make this point. At the same time that we got those biblical texts, we also got the Akkadian texts, the Babylonian Egyptian texts, Confucianist, Taoist, and Buddhist literature, even the Quran. Now, some people will say, no, 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 wait. The Bible is older than the Quran. And then others in the room will say, yeah, I know, but the academic literature is older than the biblical literature. And in one sense, you're right. In a very short timeline, you are right. There is that one is older than the other. But when you look at this from the human historical point of view, all of that literature came out more or less at the same time. We were growing up and learning and developing these ideas. And once we had the ability to write, we just plumped it all down on paper. And that's what we see happening in the last few thousand years. Now, it wasn't just paper, it wasn't just writing, we began to build things. And so you can find, for example, in Thailand and India, temples that go back a thousand years. But then you go to Britain and you find Stonehenge, which goes many thousands of years. In Egypt, we have pyramids, which are older than that. And then even fairly recently, we found some ruins in Turkey, a place called Gobekli Tepe, Tur Turkey, where we find some ruins that look very much like Stonehenge, but they're 12,000 years old. So at least for 12,000 years, there were these people worshipping some kind of deity. And it isn't just the buildings. We also made representations of these gods. So here, for example, is a fertility doll. There's all kinds of different gods that were being made. I read a scientific paper where some skeletons, some human skeletons were found in Siberia with Venus-like figurines. And that all of that was dated 60,000 years ago, 6-0. So even as far back as 60,000 years in Siberia, humans were worshipping the deity. Lord of this great being was according to them. And then lastly, we can go back even further, even 100,000 years back, and find examples of ritual burials, where people, hominids, and even just, it, this, the data seems to suggest that even Neanderthals were doing this, were burying their dead very carefully, not just leaving them in a hole in the ground, but burying them either laid out, <clears throat> laid out straight with their arms crossed, or more frequently curled up in the field position, and buried with weapons, with jewelry, with food items, sometimes even with other loved ones. And clearly the message that's being sent, to me at least, and to many other people, these people were being buried and sent off into an afterlife. They weren't just being buried and discarded. They were being sent into some kind of an afterlife. Now, we don't know what they thought about the afterlife, but my point in all this is that for thousands of years, humans have been on this search for the great being. We've not been rebelling against God. We've been trying our hardest to find out who is the great being. What is he like? What does he want? Or she or... I mean, I'm speaking now as people in different parts of the world trying to understand the great being. And so I would challenge that assertion that all humans rebelled against God. We've been trying to find them. I really do believe that. And we've come up with different ideas. And I think because of that, maybe we have a few things to learn from other world religions. I'm not saying we need to convert to other world religions, but they may have some things to teach us. So... With that, I'll leave it. I've covered a lot of ground. I, I'm sure there's a lot of questions and a lot of challenges. And I, I, again, want to emphasize I'm not here to undermine your faith. I'm here to raise some questions and prepare you for a dialogue that you're going to have, especially those of you who have kids going into university. They're going to be met, meeting these various ideas, and you need to have a response to that. Um, but the last thing I want to say then is uh, I look forward to your questions. You can contact me, uh, in addition to presenting them to me here, you can contact me at this Gmail address, uh, or I maintain a blog site, a semi-regular uh, blog site, and or you can, I've got a couple copies of books here at the table that I'm selling them, and in those books you can find those same links, the, the link to my blog site and my email address. But this is where I want to get your feedback. You tell me, Luke, have you thought about this, or whatever questions and challenges you might have.